Watch this. Think about the events that changed the world, that caused a seismic shift in the future with widespread implications. In one day, the discovery of electricity or penicillin or the double helix, Wall Street crashing in 1929, the atom bomb dropping in 1945, the moon landing in 1969. When asked about the memories of the attack on the United States on September 11, 2001, the common recited refrain, nearly everyone who remembers that Tuesday, refers to it as the day the world changed. Four passenger planes were hijacked shortly after takeoff that morning. Two from Boston, one from DC, one from New Jersey, filled with people and fuel and heading to the West Coast. That is until hijackers, members of Al Qaeda, took over control of those planes. At 8.46 AM Eastern Time, American Airlines Flight 11 crashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. At 9.03, 17 minutes later, United Flight 175 crashes into the South Tower. At 9.37, American Airlines Flight 77 crashes into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. 22 minutes later, the 110-story South Tower collapses. Eight minutes after that, at 10.07, United Flight 93 crashes into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The passengers overtaking the hijackers to keep the plane from crashing into another building, likely in DC. At 1028, the second Twin Tower, the North Tower, collapses 102 minutes after being hit by Flight 11. An estimated 17,400 people were in those towers when the nightmare began. Nobody survived above the impact zone in the North Tower. 18 managed to escape from the floors above where the plane hit in the South Tower. In all, 2,977 people were killed that day or died shortly after from injuries. That doesn't include the 19 hijackers, but it does include all 246 passengers and crew aboard those four planes, the 441 New York City first responders and the 125 at the Pentagon. Thousands would die later from exposure to toxic debris. Of those killed at the Pentagon, two were Idahoans, Brady Howell, who grew up in Sugar City, and Ron Vock, who graduated from Nampa High School. Of course, the complete toll took weeks to uncover. It took eight months to clean up the debris from the Twin Towers, what forever became known as Ground Zero. 20 years later, we wanted to look back at that day and the months and years following through the eyes of a television reporter, a chief of police, and the governor, who, despite watching it all unfold from a distance, like the rest of us, were still very closely involved in 9-11. was so unimaginable. I don't know that anybody could have envisioned that happening. They were trying to decapitate the United States of America. A second airplane, a 727. You know, there's a numbness and there's a reality. And you always ask why. Said, oh my God. It was such a collective experience. It affected everybody. The second tower, the front tower, the top portion of which is collapsing. Good Lord. And the world changed. There are no words. With the terminal road closed, people have been walking from outlying parking lots to reach the airport, and many would like a change. We, again, tried to be accommodating the public. We still are, but a lot stricter rule. My name's Mike Johnson and I was the Boise Airport Police Chief on 9-11. I was not in Boise at that time. Ironically, I was uh, outside of Washington, D.C. at a FEMA Command Training Center on a conference on terrorism. We came into class and the, the news was going, but we weren't sure if it was the news or part of the training of interaction. And uh, one of the instructors came in and says, this is not part of the training, this is real, folks. And everybody just, was glued to the TV set, and I was sitting there when the second plane went in and saw it. You know, you just shook your head, and then of course it hit the Pentagon, and uh, we were, you know, 40 miles away. 
when it hit, of course, back there, um, I called back to the airport a number of times. And they said, yeah, things are shutting down. An hour later, things are almost shut down. And three hours later, there's nobody here. No flights going in or out. The only public that was really there were people trying to get rent of cars. A few of the restaurants were still open, but there was nobody there. It'd be just like if you were there at two in the morning now. It was just, it was a ghost town. And even though this blood brother is grateful his kin was spared, he grieves for the lives lost. The thing that goes in my mind is I put myself in the place of a firefighter and all of a sudden they know automatically from the sound that the floors are collapsing and pancaking. They had that time to know it's gone, we're done. I'm Allison Uten, and on September 11th, 2001, I was a reporter at KTVB. The day that unfolded after the news broke was a day that lasted several months. Well, I was asleep, and the morning show producer called me and understandably couldn't articulate what was happening, and I couldn't figure out what he was saying, but I knew there was an emergency and that I needed to get to the station. And at that point, only the first plane had hit, and it was a tragedy. But at that point, uh, while there was a lot of speculation, one of the prevailing thoughts was it was just a, um, a really horrible aviation accident. And by the time I arrived, shortly after I arrived, the second plane hit. And then it was something completely unprecedented and uh, very difficult to wrap your head around. You know, the newsroom is such a, a place of action and you're so conditioned that when something happens, you, you go. And it, uh, it was probably the only time that I could remember where we just all stood around for um, a long time and, and became observers and not really knowing uh, how to localize it or not even really thinking yet about what does this mean. There was a third icon that was struck that morning. That icon was the spirit of the American citizen, and you can hit it time and time again, and you will never, ever, ever destroy that icon. My name is Dirk Kempthorne, and uh, during 911, I was the governor of the state of Idaho and commander in chief of the Idaho National Guard. I had just completed my morning workout, and I received a call from my wife, Patricia, and she said, you need to turn on the television immediately. And, and then the realization that the United States was under attack, commercial airliners that were turned into missiles with the sole purpose of executing American citizens. And I spoke immediately to our generals at the guard. I spoke immediately to Colonel Strick Fadden at the Idaho State Police. Uh, we had to bring up our posture as far as how do we now prepare for something we cannot envision, but being notified that the United States anywhere is now under attack. Uh, I remember that the National Guard, uh, they went to what they called DEFCON Charlie, which is just one, one level below full battle attack stage. Uh, and they began deploying their assets. We deployed to all of the major airports immediately. Uh, you remember that uh, all airplanes were immediately told to ground. Driving back, I was on the phone between the airport officers and the mayor and the airport director, and everything, again, was locked down. Immediately, I was having going through my mind, okay, this is what we're going to have to start changing. This is what we're going to have to do. And then there was a, a, a concern that do we have a potential of a terrorism threat happening in Boise, Idaho. Uh, we blocked off the road coming in uh, with Jersey barriers so nobody could pull in right in front of the terminal. If somebody else was going to do something, would they do it with an explosive device? We've got to get the council to authorize six more people immediately so that we would no longer just have somebody go down to the uh, front of the terminal once every 30 minutes. We had to have somebody down there all the time. We had to have somebody at the checkpoint all the time. And so I knew we were going to 
drove pretty fast. And for three years, we were in the hiring mode. There was 14 officers. Uh, when I left, uh, there was 39. It was the most global story that I ever covered, for sure. And also the most difficult in some ways because how do you distill it down and make it meaningful for people in Idaho? That was important for a lot of reasons, but in this instance, I think it was most important because the story was too big. It was too far away, it was too devastating, it was too unprecedented. It needed to be broken down into bite-sized pieces for it to really sink in and become real to people in Idaho. If I was in my office when the plane hit our building, I would be talking to you with a harp in my hand right now. Peter Totten worked in Washington Group's New York office. The Washington Group, for example, a, a very big local company, had offices uh, and people and lives that were lost. And that instantly became very real. Then there was the whole Muslim angle. Ali became a Muslim several years ago and wears the traditional Islamic dress. The past two days, that's made her a target. Of course you get looked at anyway because it's not the norm here. And then there were firefighters and we know what a brotherhood that is. And uh, in one case, it was literally a brotherhood. Lee held his breath, waiting to hear the fate of his brother. It was the longest four hours of his life. <laughs> There's no way to calculate that. The news when it did arrive was good. Sean was safe. But emotionally, the wounds are deep. And so these little vignettes of local people really started to create a, a rich tapestry of why this mattered in Idaho. I'm Allison Newton at Ground Zero. Just a few blocks from here. School December, I went to New York. That's when it really came into focus for me. Help them get back any confidence. I remember a big box of teddy bears being sent, you know, and these would be destined for children. This is the Anna Silver Elementary School in Lower Manhattan. People were just looking for a way to give back and to be part of the solution to such a huge problem. And that was a really beautiful part of the story and not surprising at all. I think I was really grateful to have a role. It gave me something to do, a direction, and a focus related to the tragedy. And I think because of that, maybe I was able to process it differently and uh, not feel so uh, helpless and detached from, from the story. How did it happen? How did you have that coordination of two planes in New York, one in D.C. and one in uh, Pennsylvania? This wasn't just uh, one crazy. This was a planned out situation. And what else are they planning? And uh, where else is the most vulnerable? Well, an airport in Twin Falls, Idaho, or Boise, Idaho would be pretty easy pickings. Following the attack, when we finally continued commercial travel, you went through a line and the magnetometer, and there were guards, men and women, with their weapons. That was our security. You're going to be you're going to be checked out. There wasn't a TSA. There wasn't a Homeland Security. You got to remember everything the hijackers used could legally be carried on the planes at that time. Box cutters, a pocket knife, and so that changed, of course. No more box cutters, no more park pocket knives. And I remember as, as the years went on, you know, people, well, why are we doing this in Boise? Nothing's going to happen here. Maybe not. But it's for sure if you don't do it and something happens, then everybody's, why weren't they doing that? I was receiving information continually that was confidential. Within, I would say, one or two days of the 911 attack, the FBI released its list of the top most wanted terrorists in the world. There were, I believe, 20 photographs. Military leadership came to me immediately that day, brought in the front page, laid it on my desk and said, sir, you need to know, this individual was here. He was here at Gowan Field. He came, he asked a number of very penetrating questions. We've had a program where people from other countries could come in and share information with our military, military to military, but they always came in in groups. This one came alone, but then to see his face listed as one of the top 
terrorist by the FBI told us this is serious and we don't know what next to expect. All across America today, Americans are gathering in prayer, in moments of silence. I said that that Friday, same week, that on the steps of the State House, we will have a moment of silence for those who have perished, but also for those who have been spared. And that Friday at noon, 10,000 Idahoans gathered. It filled Capitol Boulevard. The terrorists thought that they could bring us to our knees. And they brought us to our knees, but just long enough for us to kneel in prayer and then rise up in righteous indignation. You will not knock the United States down. I think like a lot of people, I probably um, had a less of a secure feeling. And I think that many people experience the feeling of vulnerability and now what? It seems like things changed and I don't know that there's any connection with September 11th. When I look back over my lifetime and I think about a before and an after, I do think the before was um, a little more naive and that the after might be girded with a little more, um, a feeling of vulnerability. What stands out to me is that in the immediate aftermath, this country came together. My concern as I look back on this 20 year period is that we have begun to divide again, to become discordant. And I don't think our leaders are helping us. And I would hope that it doesn't take a horrible disaster like 911 to once again bring us back as the United States. It, it shouldn't take a disaster. A couple of footnotes to add. The first flight out of Boise happened the following Monday, September 17th. Mike Johnson said there were only a handful of people on board. As we all know, that attack was the beginning of the war on terror, the 20 year war that ended officially just a few weeks ago. A war that included thousands of Idahoans and took the lives of more than a dozen. In May of 2004, the 116th Cavalry Brigade Combat Team, consisting of more than 3,000 soldiers, was sent to Iraq for 18 months, still the largest deployment of Idaho citizens in the history of the state. That story that Governor Kempthorne told about the terrorists visiting Gowan Field, he wouldn't tell us his name, but he did tell us that terrorist is still on the wanted list and still active in atrocities around the world. The last thing we heard from Governor Kempthorne in that piece about how he hopes it doesn't take another disaster to unite the country again. It's one of those things that just can't go unsaid. 9-11 was the last big thing that happened to all of us. Here we are two decades later and there's another big thing happening to all of us. That united us. This has only divided us more. And he's right, it shouldn't take a disaster to bring us back together. It obviously hasn't. Well, today is obviously not 9-11, the eve of it. The anniversary is tomorrow. There are several memorial events planned across the Treasure Valley. We have information at KTVB.com. But there is a permanent 9-11 memorial you can visit any day of the week, located at the Idaho Fallen Firefighters Memorial Park. It was put in place in 2014, and it includes a 10-foot steel beam from the World Trade Center.
For the first time since 2019, tonight Boise State football is going to host a full capacity crowd at Albertson Stadium. Broncos set to take on UTEP for the home opener on the blue. Now the major difference between now and 2019, well snuck in between there, is a global pandemic. Boise State says they are working to create a safe and healthy environment for all athletic and campus events. But I guess the question is, what exactly does that mean? Mm -hmm. And Joe Paris joins us now with what you've learned from BSU this afternoon to speak with them. How different will tonight be compared to, well, what BSU has had packed houses previously? Well, the hope, Ryan, is that it feels very similar tonight as it did in 2019 and prior to that when we had all the excitement on the blue for all those years. Now, likely it is going to feel a little different tonight, but Boise State tells us that they have the full slate of campus traditions back and ready for tonight. Of course, COVID is still a major discussion for game day. Boise State has taken major steps on campus with their COVID policies, and that, of course, does extend to football games on the blue. A big one that a lot of people are talking about, masks. Boise State has a campus policy that includes wearing a mask, so two to be clear, fans who attend the Broncos game at Albertson Stadium tonight, they will need to wear a face mask while on campus there. What about the enforcement of that policy? A lot of questions about that. Here's the answer on enforcement from Boise State spokesperson Mike Sharp. We're practicing kind of an honor system here. Uh, it's been 650 days since uh, these, these football players have been able to play in front of their fans. And, and it's not just the players who have missed it, it's the fans themselves. I think uh, Bronco Nation understands what's at stake and understands that our best chance at getting six home games where we're able to invite as many fans as possible is to practice uh, the, the strategies that work. Brian, the hope is that the community takes all of this very seriously on game day so that future games can be hosted with full houses packed with fans. But the reality here is this. If COVID continues to spread at a high rate in our community and it continues to present challenges like we've seen in recent days and weeks, there's a good chance that Boise State home games will be forced to look different in a bad way. All right. So the, while on campus, that means the parking lot during tailgating as well. Masks 
being asked to be born. They're asking people to wear masks. Are they going to get all 30,000 people around the stadium to be wearing them every second of the event? No, that's the truth, but they're asking the community to do their part to please wear a mask tonight. It is a campus policy. They're hoping that people take it seriously with the honor system. With Thanks, Joe. I wish we had more time, but we don't. But we'll see you next week.